Jason. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, kind of this running joke with Jason and I that if it's a long passage of scripture, we kind of give it to the other person, but I decided this morning that I would take one for the team and read it. Um, Isaiah 40 is one of the most eloquent passages in all of the Bible, and that's not uh, an exaggeration. And I'd like to read um, Isaiah 40, uh, all 31 verses, it's worth it. So let's, uh, let's start there this morning, and I'll explain the passage as we get going. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power. His arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or the breadth of, the, of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord, or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge, or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. 
He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. You know, it's human nature to minimize or underestimate what other people do. It's very easy to kind of throw ourselves a, uh, I don't know if pity party is the right word, but a congratulatory party. And what we do is so hard, what other people do, psh, that's easy. Just take teachers, for example. I mean, they have a cushy job, right? They're, they're done their day at 3.30 and they have the summers off. If you know a school teacher, you know that's not true. Well, part of it's true, but they have a very hard job. Or, or, or the professions that uh, traditionally maybe have a bigger paycheck than other traditions, or other uh, professions, pardon me. It's easy to say, oh, their jobs are, their jobs are so nice. But often those jobs that have a, a bigger paycheck, it's for good reason. What they do is hard. And there's a lot of a, a mental stress and, and take home aspects of the job. And maybe I'm throwing myself a, a pity party here, but um, back when I was a, a seminary student, my brother used to give me a hard time about what I would do. And, and he'd say, how difficult can a theology exam be? Just put God down for every answer and you'll get an A. Two responses to that. My brother's not here this morning, but if he was, I would say this. Just ask my Greek and Hebrew students how easy the course is. And the second thing, hopefully not being um, stereotypical with, with the answer or, or, um, or trite, but often God, or more specifically focusing on God, is the right answer when we're anxious, when we're worried, when we're worn out, when we're discouraged, when we're uptight, when we need some encouragement. Maybe it's at the beginning of a, a, of a new school year, and yes, I realize that's coming up. I, I don't like to say it in the middle of August, but it's true. Isaiah 40, the passage that we just read, was written to a dejected, desperate nation. The nation of Israel. They had given up hope, and God wanted them to refocus their attention. Now, let's just set the, the stage, and we'll geek out historically for a minute. 600 years, almost 600 years before Jesus, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you've watched Veggie Tales, you know him as Nebuchadnezzar, the giant pickle. <laughs> he delivered the final blow to the southern part of the bigger nation of Israel. That southern part was called Judah. In 586 BC, he, he delivered the final blow. He rolled in, destroyed the temple, and took lots of captives off to Babylon. Not everyone, um, but he'd been doing that for some time. Some time, pardon me. The great temple built by Solomon, laid in ruins. And for 70 years, 70 years, 1,200 kilometers from home, the people wondered, did God know what they were going through? Is, is God, does he care? Some maybe even thought God had died. Because in the ancient world, if one nation conquered another, that meant that your God had conquered, or pardon me, the, the foreign God had conquered the, the, the God of, of the nation. And they wanted to know, was God listening to their cries for help? And it's interesting that much of the way that our passage addresses these questions is first and foremost by redirecting Israel's attention so they refocused on God and, and who He is. Not just kind of abstract notions about, about God, not the stereotypical answers on a, a theology exam, but what God is like. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One? In other words, 
God is more than just this kind of far out there notion, this deistic, up there, not really concerned with us idea. And the, the Babylonians, like other ancient cultures, they thought that the movement of the, the planets and that, that the stars themselves kind of represented their gods or maybe even were gods themselves. <clears throat> but look at what verse 26 says. The God of Israel is the one who's in control of it all. Even the vastness of the night sky is subordinate to him. It does what he says. So Israel would focus on their incomparable God. That's why he's given this message to his prophet. Now I realize that the reasons why we might need to refocus and our need for encouragement might not be as severe as an exiled people some 2,600 years ago. But you know what? In life, in ministry, in, in our vocations, being anxious and worried and worn out and discouraged or uptight, it, it's bad news. That doesn't change. The circumstances or the, 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 the drasticness of the circumstances change. But we all go through seasons where we feel like life stinks. And one evening when, um, this, put, this helped me put it in perspective, one evening when our kids were little, I, I was getting them out of the van and I was amazed at the stars and all I could say was wow. It, it was actually when we lived in Stuyak and you could, you know, without the bright lights of the city, you could see the stars in an incredible way. And Christine and, and, and the kids thought this was incredible. And Christine told the boys that um, they should always take time to look at the stars. And that from that point on, whenever we would get out of the van on a clear night, and I forgot to look at the stars, Elijah, who's not here this morning, he would, he would offer his gentle rebuke. He would say, Daddy, we always need to take time to look at the stars. And you know what? It's not such a bad idea, especially if it helps us get our focus off of our limitations and our stress, and it causes us to focus on God and what he is capable of. And that's just one of the many things that God has done to showcase his power and what he is capable of. And according to Isaiah 40, God is, a cap is capable of a lot more than the exiles in Babylon were giving credit for. In their anger and in their dejection, the exiles were saying and believing the kinds of things that angry and dejected people say and believe. But notice this. God doesn't get mad. Instead, Isaiah wants them to rethink things. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? By my God? The fact that the prophet asks these questions tells us that the exiles thought that God didn't care about their way or their future, and in dis despair, these tired and discouraged people thought that God didn't give a hoot about their situation. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because Isaiah 40 is this eloquent declaration to the exiles that God does care. In fact, he's preparing a way for them to go home. Now, if, you, if you're in Babylon and you want to go west to Jerusalem... The shortest distance between two points is what? Straight line. A straight line between Babylon and Jerusalem is right through the desert. Prepare a highway in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's what Isaiah is talking about. He's preparing a way home from them. And that's figurative because nobody in their right mind would walk through the desert. They would go around. But God's making a point. He's preparing a way for them to go home. And God's not unfair. His understanding has no bounds. And so God knows and God will do what is best for his people. God will show them that he is for them and not against them. And the same is true for us, folks. In Jesus, God completes Israel and everyone else's return from exile by bringing us out of the most severe exile of all. The one of 
of spiritual and, 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 and selfishness. Spiritual exile caused by sin. Caused by doing things our way. And this is truly good news because in Jesus we see most perfectly that God truly is for us, not against us. In Jesus we see that God knows and will do what is best for us. In Jesus we see that God cares about us. And not just a little bit, but immensely, completely, perfectly. And that's one of the mind-boggling mysteries of our faith. That the creator of the universe, the one who is unmatched in power and authority, is the same God who feeds his flock like a shepherd and gathers the lambs in his arms and gently leads the mother sheep. The one who has measured the waters and weighed the mountains is the same God who in Jesus has promised to be with us to the very end of the age. And unlike a lot of promises that we hear every single day, God's promise is is not so general or vague that it's worthless. I've seen firsthand here in this church, in your lives and in my lives, how God is at work and very present with us. What Jason reminded us of at the beginning of the service is not just some pithy religious saying, you know, God's with us and we need to remember that. Isn't that cute? Stick it on a card. It's true. Do we really believe that? And it's a good thing to do. And and maybe many of us are in the, the middle of vacation or just coming off of vacation as we anticipate the beginning of a new kind of routine with September. To see to remember, to look back on how God was with us, helped us in the past, not just in our lives, but in our friends and our family, and use that as encouragement, as a, as a challenge too, to anticipate, to expect how God will help us in the coming months and years. But the great thing about the way God cares for us is that he offers more than just his presence, as great as that is, don't get me wrong. God offers more than just words of comfort, as great as they are. The way God cares is powerful, and it's active, and it changes lives, and it changes our attitudes. That's because our incomparable God, who cares, makes good on his promises by actually helping us. That's Good news as well, because if you're tired and you're frustrated like the exiles in Babylon, they needed more than just words. And I don't know about you, but I need more than just words. They needed God to make a tangible difference in their lives. And that's why Isaiah 40 ends the way it does. The first thing that Christine ever gave me as a gift actually has this verse on it. It's in my office at, um, at, at Acadia. And, and it says, it's worth reading again. The Lord gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will grow faint and weary. The young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. This is one of the most famous verses in Isaiah. And when people talk about this verse, usually they focus on the lines that speak of, uh, of renewed strength and mounting up on, uh, on wings as eagles. And there's nothing wrong with that. The verse is there to remind us that God will do just that. But there's something God wants us to do as well, and that's to wait for Him. Those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. Now, depending on what version of the Bible you have, you might have those who hope in the Lord, and there's nothing wrong with either of those translations. The word here in Hebrew expresses the idea of looking looking at something with confident expectations. And so what Isaiah wants 
his readers to do is to look to God confidently and expectantly, believing wholeheartedly that he's not abandoned them and that he will help them, actually help them, give them what they need to trust him and to live out the life he's called them to. And Isaiah can be confident because when God promises something, when God speaks, God acts. Another famous verse from this incredible passage is verse 8. The word of our Lord will stand forever. And this is a bold declaration that what God says is as good as done. The incomparable God who does things just beyond what we can even imagine or think will help us. Sometimes, I think our piety gets in the way of us doing this, waiting on God, hoping on God. If in our minds we've confused confidence on the one hand with presumption. Those are two very different things. If, if God hasn't promised to renew our strength when, when we look, uh, look to him with confident expectation, um, we really, you know, we really need to, if he's done that, we really need to look to him confidently. If he's promised to help us, it's okay to look to him expectantly. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about some, 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 uh, messed up version of the gospel it says if you know you pray that you win the lottery you're going to win the lottery I mean, you know I, I'd really like to have a, a Ferrari no it doesn't work that way God's, one of my profs in seminary used to say God is not a cosmic vending machine you don't pop in a quarter and out comes the blessing it doesn't work that way what it does mean is that when we give everything we have to the ministries, to the life that God has called us to. When we walk with Him, not perfectly, because none of us is perfect, but when we are trusting Him, we can have that confident expectation that He will always be will, with us, that He will give us strength when we're weary. And the physical, emotional, and su spiritual support that we long for, God will empower us and he will keep us running. He will give us what we need. And putting his stamp of approval on Isaiah 40, and um, Caitlin was right, just the way that the themes and the songs and everything came together very nicely this week. Jesus put his stamp of approval on Isaiah 40 when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I know I've said something similar here before, but I, I feel like I need to say it again this morning. Time out. I read Jesus' words here about his yoke being easy and him being gentle and humble in heart, and I want to say, wait a second, Jesus. Following you is not always very easy. Sometimes the Christian life, often the Christian life seems really, really hard. But compared to the burden of discouragement, compared to the burden of being uptight, compared to the burden of being anxious and, and, and stressing out, and trying to do things on my own steam, on our own steam, you know what? Jesus' burden is light. His yoke is easy. And following his lead is what leads us to rest. So what does God want us to do when we need encouragement, when we need to refocus, when we're anxious, when we're worn out, burned out even, discouraged? Fill in the blank. God says that he's ready, willing, and able to help. And our part, what we need to do is be confident and trust him that he will 
fulfill his promise, that he is trustworthy, that he will do it. I would like to give us an opportunity this morning. Maybe you are a, a long time follower of Jesus and you need to recharge. You need to, to acknowledge to God that, yes, I, I believe, maybe it's shaky, that God is ready, willing, and able. But just say that to God. You know, I want to believe that. I want to trust in that. Ask God to make those promises real to you. Maybe you've never accepted this, this power and this hope that we have in Jesus. And I, I want to say to you this morning that Jesus calls you to himself. Like he's called each of us. He loves you. His yoke is easy and his burden is light compared to all the other burdens that there are. Especially the burden, the prideful burden of doing things on our own steam. And all of our brokenness, all of our strivings, all of the things that we do to try to patch our lives together on the cross... Jesus took all that junk on himself so he could take it away from us. That's one of the the many reasons, the biggest reason, in fact, that his yoke is easy because he took the biggest burden of all. So I encourage you to trust him or talk to somebody about that. I'm going to give us a few minutes now just to quiet our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage and its, its power, I think, largely lies in the fact that when this group of dejected exiles, when they needed some news from you, it wasn't so much what you were going to do, although that was part of it, more importantly, the overwhelming focus of the passage is on who you are and what you are capable of because of who you are. And I know, and I know many of us here know, that it's so, so often the temptation is to stress about how to get out of a mess or a mindset or whatever. It may be. But may our focus even this summer, but in the coming year, may it be on who you are. And we thank you that your power and your grace are incomparable, that your love is incomparable. Forgive us for the times when we forget that and help us to keep that in the forefront. And help us to remember too that throughout the scriptures there are so many so many pictures, including Isaiah 40, of, of who you are and what you're capable of. But we see that most fully and most perfectly in Jesus himself. And we ask that we would know his presence with us and his help. For the last thing you said to your disciples was that you would be with them always to the very end of the age. In his name we pray, amen.